So welcome everybody to this evening's Dharma talk in this series of talk for this meditation retreat. So here we're giving talks both for the yogis here who are just so close to enlightenment. (laughs) And all those people who come and sit in their backs, back, who are getting off on the peaceful, enlightened energy of all the yogis here. So hopefully you all enjoying this series of talks. But this evening's talk is a special talk. This is no ordinary talk. This is one of the deep talks about one of the most fundamental insights of the Buddha. No self. And it's wonderful to see so many no selves here tonight Listen to my talk. <laughs> you aren't here. It's like talking to an empty hall. So I don't have to worry about what I say. <laughs> so this is one of the great teachings of the Buddha and no self. And it comes in all sorts of layers of profundity. Just from the ordinary ideas of non-self and non-identification into the deeper understanding of the nature of who you are. Who are you anyway? Listen and you might find out. But first of all, when we have the teaching of non-self, It can, first of all, be on the ordinary level of our daily lives. In the ordinary level of our daily lives, it can solve so many problems in our daily lives. There's so many things, if we could only realize it's no self, that we could actually let go of and be at peace with. We don't have to worry about it. The problem is, is that each one of us, we have what we call an identity, who we think we are. It's our identity. And all you yogis coming here, you're going to have an identity crisis. (laughs) When you find out everything you thought you were is not real. So then you find out exactly who you are and find out what you are. And this is the process of deep meditation. But first of all, I had an identity crisis years ago. But think of me. I was born in England. I was trained in Thailand. I lived in Australia. And now I'm in Malaysia. I am very confused. <laughs> because it's true. You know, I've been here into Malaysia many, many times. And so I've known many of you for a long time. I count you as my friends. So when I, the plane lands in KLI airport and you see all these wonderful people waiting for you outside, you think, oh, isn't it wonderful? I'm coming home. And then I go off to Penang, which I'm going in a couple of days. When I see all those devotees in Penang, I think, oh, isn't it great? I feel like I'm coming home. And then after Penang, I go to Singapore. When I see all the devotees in Singapore, I had such a wonderful time in Singapore, I think, I'm coming home. And then I go off to Thailand where I spent nine years in these villages and I think, oh, I'm coming home. And then I go back to Perth where I've been living for the last 21 years and I think, oh, isn't it nice to be home? And every now and again you go and visit your family in England and you think, I'm going home again. I don't know where I belong. (laughs) Even many of you know that the English and the Australians, one of the things they always battle over is cricket. They love these cricket matches. And when it's Australia playing England in the cricket, it's not just a game, it's war. It's serious business. So sometimes people ask me, who do you support? You were born in England, but now you live in Australia. Who do you support? And I always say, I support the referee, the umpire. (laughs) I don't know which team to support. The English or Australia, I don't know. But the point is, if you start to identify with one side, then you suffer. If you start to identify and you think, yes, I'm English, when the Australians Australians win, oh, that's very hard. If you think you're Australian and the English win, oh, that's very hard. If Malaysia is playing soccer with Singapore, If Singapore wins, oh, that's very hard. (laughs) So, 
why is it that we identify with these things? And when we identify with these things, not only is it unreal, untenable, but also we suffer quite a lot. Are there any feminists here? <laughs> Are you a feminist? Because if you're a feminist, you think that you belong, or that you, you think that you are a woman. Are you a woman? If you identify with being that, you suffer enormously. Are you a man? All of those of you vegetarians here, is that who you are? Think about it. What is a vegetarian? It's someone who eats vegetables. So what's a humanitarian? It must be someone who eats humans. <laughs> There's a lot of English language. <laughs> so humanitarian, someone who eats humans. But <laughs> so the, po- <laughs> the point is, when I look at my body, is my body a male? Is my body English? Is my when you actually look at these things, I cannot really say who my body belongs to, because for the last I think it's, it's, uh, seven or eight, nine days or something. I've eaten Malaysian food. So probably most of my, um, my cells in my body have been fed by Malaysian food. So does that make me a Malaysian now? Probably my body is mostly Malaysian. If you stay in Australia, if you go and visit my monastery and do a retreat for one month in Australia, you've eaten so much Australian food, you must be Australian too, aren't you? What makes you who you are? Is it your body? You know, for many, many years we always thought that our self, our soul, lived in our heart. And then when Dr. Christian Bernard, Barnard, or Bernard, whatever his name was, did the first heart transplant, it shocked a lot of people because they wondered, actually, if you had a heart transplant, who would you end up being? The original owner of the heart or the new recipient? Which self would dominate? Of course, we all know now that if you get somebody's heart, you're still your old self. But... What would happen if we had a brain transplant? If I died and I donated my organs, including my brain, to you, would you end up sort of being able to tell funny stories? (laughs) Would you be Ajahn Brahm or would you be yourself? Who would you be? Now, it hasn't happened yet. But I will tell you what would happen. You will end up being the same person you were before. Not the brain, but the body. Because you are not your body. And anybody who has got at least a little bit of insight, a little bit of understanding, especially if you look at your past lives. Now that gets very confusing if you remember your past lives. All you girls were probably boys before. All you boys were probably girls. All you people who were Buddhists were probably Christians before. All the Christians were probably Muslims. All the Muslims were probably Buddhists. Who are you? When you look over many, many lives, it gets very, very difficult to identify with being one particular gender or one particular nation. You've been all nations, all genders. You swap roles over many, many lifetimes. The point is that if you can only remember your previous lives, how could you identify with this particular race, this particular gender, or even this particular religion? If you could only remember your past lives, there could be no wars, there could be no conflict anymore. How could you go into war against your brothers and sisters, literally your own flesh and blood? It's only when we identify with being a particular race or nation or religion or gender that we can have all this conflict. So never think of yourself as a Malaysian, a Singaporean, not even a human being. You are just this beautiful mind inside of you which goes from life to life. You can see that if you develop a bit of depth in your meditation. You are not your body. So if someone comes along and calls you camel face, you ugly camel face, 
Why do you get upset? You say, that's just my body. That's not me. You know that sometimes though people identify with their bodies, just like people identify with their cars. Some people drive a Rolls Royce and they think, they're some, they, think they are a Rolls Royce. <laughs> In other words, they think they're, they get proud, they get arrogant, they get conceited, look at me. But is the driver the Rolls Royce? Sometimes all you've got is an old beat up bicycle. Does that mean that you are the bicycle? Sometimes we should differentiate the driver from the vehicle. And then we don't have to worry about the vehicle so much. If your car gets dented and gets scratched, you can still use it to get to Chempaka Buddhist Lodge every evening. It doesn't really matter, it's useful, that's good enough. So if your body gets scratched, if it gets beaten up by old age, if it gets sick, as long as it can be used, that's good enough. Are you your body? The Buddha said again and again and again. Be careful, don't identify with being your body. If you identify with your body, you know what you do. You look at yourself every morning in the mirror. Am I pretty this morning? <laughs> and if you're not as pretty as the person sitting next to you, oh, you suffer a lot. It's amazing how much suffering especially women have with their body. Many years ago, a man ran me up. His daughter was depressed, suicidal. She had a problem. He tried all these counsellors. Nothing worked. So out of desperation, he decided to see a Buddhist monk. I was the last resort, probably because he ran out of money. <laughs> you know, monks are cheap. Is that one of the, one of the stories in the book <laughs> about this lady? You may, you may have heard the story before. This lady who rang up, an American lady, rang up this American monk and said, I hear you teach meditation. He said, yes, madam, I teach meditation. How much do you charge? He said, nothing, madam, it's free. She said, well, you can't be any good then, and hung up the phone. <laughs> That's what happens sometimes if it's for free. People think that it's worthless. So these days we never say it's free. We don't say it's free, what is it? It's priceless, yes. So the teachings here today are priceless. <laughs> They're not free. So, in this particular case, the man brought his daughter. She's a 14-year-old girl. And she, the, the father never told me the problem. So I had to coax it out of this girl. It took me about 20, 25 minutes. She said, what's the problem? Why are you depressed? And finally she let me know. She said, my nose is too big. <laughs> and that was actually making her so depressed it was ruining her studies, ruining her social life. She was suicidal because she thought she had a big nose. Now you may laugh upon that, but you little girls, if you remember when you were a teenager at that age, you probably can understand what she was going through. And at that time I wasn't a very skillful monk, so I decided to be my scientist who I was before. So I looked at her nose and I mentally measured it. <laughs> and I compared it to all the other noses which I'd seen in my life and I did a quick statistical analysis and I told the, the girl, I said, uh, Madam, so your nose is average. <laughs> it's not the most beautiful nose I've ever seen, I must confess that, but it's certainly not the most ugly. It's just an ordinary nose, that's all it is. <laughs> and that didn't help at all. <laughs> she went away as depressed <laughs> as when she came in. I tried my best, but sometimes you can't succeed. But it taught me, now why is it that we worry so much about our nose? or about our eyes, or about our hair. How many people go to the beauty salon and spend a lot of money? How much do you spend on your hair? I don't spend very much at all on my hair. <laughs> this is smart, I don't care what I look like. Even though you can imagine what it's like being a monk in the West. I used to have some great fun dressing up in these robes in the West in the early days. I was visiting some of my relations once in the Midlands of England. And I was walking down the street with my cousin and all these people were pointing at me and laughing. I didn't know why until I found out there was a circus in town and I thought I was one of the clowns. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> a true story. <laughs> I don't mind. Because if people call you a clown, what do you do? You laugh, yes. When the world laughs, you laugh as well. Then no one is ever laughing at you. They're only laughing with you. Now that's a very powerful piece of wisdom. If you make a fool of yourself and everyone starts laughing at you, you laugh as well. Then no one ever laughs at you. They only laugh with you. The point, <laughs> the point is, it's only because we have this idea of a self. That I am my body or I am a monk or I am this and I am that. If you don't hold on to that idea of a self, then if you've got a big nose, it doesn't really matter because you are not your nose. <laughs> you are not your pretty face, or you girls. All you boys never marry a pretty girl. It's true, never marry a pretty girl. Because usually the pretty girls, they don't need to develop their character. They just rely upon their good looks, they can't cook, they're not charming. <laughs> and the looks don't last very long. <laughs> so, so, so you want to lose it from day one. So the point is that why is it that young men, they look at a girl and they like it just because she looks pretty? Because they're marrying a body. They're not marrying a person. If you don't know the idea of non-self, you're going to get in big trouble in life. It's the same with girls, marry this hunky boy. He may look very strong and fit now, but imagine what he looks like when he's 60 or 70. And you're stuck with him then. <laughs> so, the thing is, you're not marrying a body, you're marrying a person. So, that first of all, that you, you can't identify with the body as being you. Do you understand that? Do you really understand that? What happens if you go to the doctor and he said, you've got cancer? Are you upset? Why? It's not you haven't got cancer. Your body's got cancer, that's all. Not you. The problem is when we say, ah, my, I have got cancer, my body's got cancer, I'm dying. That's when you find out if you're attached to this body. Only when it's threatened do you find out. It's like one of my disciples, he went to the, the doctor, he told him he had cancer. He only had one month to live, said the doctor. The disciple, only one month to live? That's terrible. I don't think I can pay your bills within one month. Okay, I'll give you two months to live then. <laughs> well, business is business. <laughs> no, the point is, it's only the body. It's not you. And it's important to understand a person is different than their body. Because then, if you see a sick body, when you go to a hospital and visit a friend who's sick and who's dying, Never talk to the body, as I said the other day. You don't go and say, how are you feeling today? That's what the doctors and nurses say. You talk to the person. Because sometimes the body changes, comes and goes. They're not the body. It's the same when I went to teach in prisons. One of the terrible things in jails was that everyone in a jail thought they were a prisoner, a criminal. And I told them, look, you are not a criminal. You are a person who's done a criminal act. And there's a lot of difference between being a criminal and someone who has done a criminal act. There's this old story in psychology about these two boys who were with their mothers in a supermarket checkout in parallel aisles. One boy dropped a carton of milk and the milk splashed all over the floor. In this, at about the same time, in the next aisle in the supermarket, another boy dropped a jar of honey, and it went smash on the floor too. The mother of the boy who dropped the milk said, you stupid child. The mother of the boy who dropped the honey 
said that was a stupid thing you did. 